So let's talk a little bit first about what is a letter of recommendation? Why is it important? Who do you want to request them from if you're applying to genetic counseling graduate school? And then how should you request them? Welcome to Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel with Katie Lee. All the best resources you'll ever need at Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel. Hey guys, it's me, Katie Lee, CGC, and I am sweaty because my dog, no joke, just walked into wet cement. I'm gonna see if I can find the um, ring footage to put in here. My son left the door open, my dog walked into wet cement and I had to chase him and it's 90 degrees. Anyways, if you'd like tips on how to get into genetic counseling graduate school or to learn more about genetic counseling as a career, please like and subscribe. Follow me so you can get all the updates when I release my videos. Today, I'm talking about letters of recommendation. Why? Because it's time to be requesting them. If you're gonna be applying for admission in 2022, you should already be uh, about to request, email, talk to any of your bosses, colleagues, professors that you are planning to request letters of recommendation for. So let's talk a little bit first about what is a letter of recommendation? Why is it important? Who do you want to request them from if you're applying to genetic counseling graduate school? And then how should you request them? And then I'd love to take any questions you have about letters of recommendation down below and I'll probably make another video next week about, about letter of recommendations in general. All right, so letters of recommendation are usually required when you apply to a grad program, PhD program, a fellowship, whatnot. And they're really important. They're kind of like your personal statement and that it's the one way that um, reviewers of your application can get to know you. So we want them to be as personal as possible. You want reviewers who know you personally and can say things that aren't just generic, like Katie's a really good student. We want personal traits, personal stories, ideally, kind of like with your personal statement. For genetic counseling, how many letters of recommendation do you need? Well, it's going to depend on the program. Um, I'd say all of the programs fall somewhere between two to four letters of recommendation are required. And most are three letters of recommendation. Importantly, some programs specify that they want a letter of recommendation from a genetic counselor, one academic letter, meaning from a professor, or one from an advocacy role. Um, so you want to be sure that you've mined the website and you understand if a program is requesting specific letters of recommendation and you're following through on that. If they're not requesting that those letters of recommendation come from a specific source or specific sources, then you can use whatever people in your professional life or academic life you think are going to write the most positive recommendation for you. But I would also keep in mind that you don't really want three academic recommendations or three genetic counselor recommendations. You probably want a little bit of each thing. So if the programs that you're applying to don't have a specific recommendation, I would suggest doing one academic reference. So a professor that you did well in their class or you attended office hours, went above and beyond on projects, they know you well, you TA'd for them, whatever it might be. Um, ideally, a science, a psych course, but doesn't have to be necessarily. Sometimes I think it could be nice if you have great grades in your science and psych courses anyways to show off that you're strong in a different area that's somehow related to genetic counseling, so that could be just fine. Okay, so you have an academic reference, a research reference or recommender. So if you've been involved in research, ideally the PI from your laboratory, if you don't work closely with them and you work closer with like a grad or a PhD student, that's fine. Really, the ideal way to go about that is maybe the grad student and the PI go in on a letter together, or the grad student might draft a letter for the PI, but ultimately they're the ones signing off on it. If you did something related to advocacy, like crisis counseling or whatever that may be, a letter from your manager or supervisor there. If you had an internship with genetic counselors, a letter from one of those genetic counselors that you got to know best about your skill set. Um, other options for recommenders potentially could be bosses at other jobs. You don't need to be limited to those few categories, but those are the areas where it would be ideal if you can get a recommender from each of those categories, in my opinion. 
Um, so let me just briefly talk about who I ended up using. Some of my programs, I can't remember which, required four recommenders. So I remember I actually reached out to five because I was worried that one of them specifically who was retiring might be a little bit flaky or challenging to um, pound down to send in those letters of recommendation. So I used a genetic counselor who I had a summer internship with. She knew me very well. I was the only intern. So I spent um, many days with her. So she was able to provide a strong letter of reference. I used the nurse practitioner who was my supervisor when I volunteered in the locked psychiatric ward at University of Wisconsin Hospitals. And she knew me well. I volunteered there for about a year and a half or three semesters, I believe. So she knew me very well and knew that I was really passionate about mental illness. I'd shared with her that I wanted to get into genetic counseling and kind of told her about the career, which she wasn't familiar with. And um, she was a great recommender because she could speak towards more towards that advocacy side and the psychosocial side of genetic counseling. I used a professor and a PI. During undergrad, I worked in the Gernsbacher Autism Laboratory. So I was um, there for, so I was doing research there, but I also took that professor's class on autism. Um, so she knew me as both a student and a research assistant essentially. So she wrote one of the letters. And then for the schools that required four, I had two kind of wild cards. I had another professor, the professor who taught my epigenetics course. I loved that course and did well in it and attended office hours and was just really fascinated by the topic. So I thought that would be a decent option. I didn't know the professor that well, but still it was something. And then I also used a professor, well, it doesn't really matter that they were a professor, but a, a family that I had nannied for for three years throughout undergraduate as a final like wild card letter of recommendation, which isn't ideal, but you know what? It was what I had. So now let's talk about actually requesting the letter and how to do it. I want you to know that for any of your professors, this is a normal part of their job. They receive these requests and they get these letters of recommendation out because it is part of their job, it's normal. Now for other people, like for me, that nurse practitioner from the psych ward, it wasn't a particularly common part of her job, but she they're willing to do it. They want to see you succeed if you have genuine relationships with these people. I think what can be more scary is, especially getting those academic references if you've been out of school for a little while, but know that the worst thing that can happen is that they say no to you. And if you're watching this video in advance, like you're not planning to apply until 2023 or 2024, start making those connections. I mean, it, it's not gonna hurt for multiple reasons. Now, when you're ready to ask for the letter, if the person you're asking for is like a current boss, your PI, um, a professor, and you still are on campus or near com campus, and it's COVID safe, I would go to their office hours or schedule a short meeting just to discuss your plans for graduate school briefly, explain more about genetic counseling if they're not aware, and ask for the letter in person. If that person is no longer geographically by you or you don't, you know, you can't just drop by in office hours because it's like an old supervisor, an old boss, I would definitely send an email. And the email does not need to be long, but it can be depending on your relationship with that person. So I was looking back at my emails from 2012 and just seeing what I had typed out and whether I was embarrassed of them or not. And actually they were pretty good. So for some of the people like that nurse practitioner, I hadn't been working with her for a while because I had graduated. I didn't work there the last, I didn't volunteer there the last semester. So she hadn't seen me or heard from me in probably like eight or nine months. I kind of just reintroduced myself. Hi, this is Katie, um, one of the undergrad students who volunteered in the psych ward from this date to this date. I was the one who would always bring in crafts like cards and ornaments and types of bookmarks and things to make. And then you want to throw in a compliment. I think that's always good. You want to say, I really enjoyed my time learning from you at the psychiatric ward and how you dedicated your whole career to helping individuals with mental illness. And because a passion of mine is psychiatric genetic counseling or psychiatric genetics, I was wondering if you could write me a positive recommendation for my grad school applications. Something like that. Um, so something you admired about them or, um, or it could be like why you're asking for the recommendation because I enjoyed your class so much. I loved working in your lab and I learned so much under you, whatever that might be. You're going to ask for that letter of recommendation and then you're going to include a paragraph about the details. So the details will be, I'm planning to apply to six schools and here's a table of all of the schools the links to their website and when the letters are due. 
Um, and that's important because for most genetic counseling grad school applications, unfortunately, it is a bit of a pain for the letter for the letter writers. They do need to go to like these individual drop boxes for each school that open at different times. It's not like a one and done situation, which would be so nice if they could just upload their letters one time and it could be over with. Um, so you want to give them the warning that it's going to look like you know, different websites on different dates to upload their letters. Now, importantly, attachments. There are some things you always want to attach. You definitely need to attach an updated, nice, clean CV. So you should already have them working on your CV, so throw that in there. You're going to want to attach your personal statement if you have a nice draft of it, one that you're happy with. You're going to want to attach a transcript, specifically if this is an academic uh, type of reference or recommender. And then, like I said, it's helpful to have a table of all of the schools, the due dates, and then some of my recommenders ask for information about the programs. So what I would recommend is having like each school be a hyperlink to go to that program's genetic counseling page so they could learn more about the program if they wanted. Okay, so that's the gist of asking for a positive letter of recommendation. Hopefully that's a good starting point. If you have questions for me about your letters of recommendation, please write them down in a comment below and I will plan to make another video about letter recommendation, common, common questions. All right, thanks for watching you guys. Remember, please like and subscribe. See ya.